our text actually is uh, the first five verses of Corinthians 2. I had Sarah read the first one, but I'll be referring to all five of these verses. I think this uh, is the, the point uh, where we could stop there in this chapter. Now, uh, Paul is continuing to discuss uh, this matter that he picked up in the 17th verse of the previous chapter. It's when he's having to go back with these brethren, you understand. He's having to go back at the point where a wisdom of men had entered the congregation. Men had come in from behind, come in behind Paul with a wisdom of men, and they see what the corruption it brought with him. So Paul is he's still addressing this wisdom that comes from God, and uh, he and and he says, you know, he leaves off uh, that la- uh, that first chapter that no flesh shall glory in the, in his presence. And uh, so this is, uh, Paul is trying to make this, he doesn't try. He makes this case about uh, the wisdom of men, and he contrasts it to the wisdom that comes from God. And we, uh, we start here in the uh, first verse, the second chapter. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear, and much trembling And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in this demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul said, I came not. I came not. Uh, when I came to you, I came not with the excellency of speech, nor the excellency of wisdom. My, spe- my uh, speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. It, it did not have anything in there about that. I was determined not to know anything among you. Instead, I came knowing only Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came with the demonstration of the spirit and the power declaring the testimony of God. So he puts this in opposition to men who have come in behind him. Said, this is how I came. Yeah. And so Paul had a testimony to give, you see. It was the testimony of God. And that's what Paul preached to them, having the testimony of God in Christ Jesus. Now, that's the kind of preaching that these brethren needed to hear. That's the kind of preaching we want to hear. Now, I can't myself, I can't get enough of that kind of preaching that is the testimony of God, right. you see, what God has said. Yeah. I don't want to have anything to do, really, what man's got to say. Really, I don't, I don't want to hear it. There's no other testimony, you see, that's going to get us to heaven. Actually, you know, you get up and you preach a different testimony. Well, uh, that's going to do the opposite thing, isn't it? It will really work to keep you out of heaven, a testimony it, 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 it is sourced of the wisdom of men, come from men. Uh, another testimony, just to just put it bluntly, another testimony other, other than the one that God has given, it'll send you to hell, brethren. Yeah. So that, that, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, uh, one testimony can be relied upon 100% yeah. to take you to glory. The other testimony, which comes from men, yeah. will take you in the other direction right quick, too. Uh, in other words, you just can't make it to glory on any other testimony than the one that God has given. Christ bought this testimony. You see, and Paul, that's the one Paul's preaching. And I, brother, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Paul didn't have any interest whatsoever in rhetoric, good-sounding words, attention getting things like this and speechy fine he just he just have any interest in it all that right. paul is known for declaring he said i come declaring the testimony of god paul is known for declaring this was paul's opening words to the athenians on mars hill whom therefore you ignorantly worship him i declare Amen. unto you yeah. we know this was the manner of paul it, and we can see this was the manner of paul and probably in all of his occasions he called that the uh, he called the ephesian elders they probably met right there on the shore there in the sand and he said uh, for i have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of god mm-hmm. see I, I have not held back so so he declared it was his nature mm-hmm. to declare the record of god of god given mm-hmm. paul de- continues to declare the whole counsel of god here right. and while this letter is written to address all kind of problems that paul probably won't even have to go there he do- he doesn't offer them some new aspects or, or uh, we're going to try this now approach or anything like this. Uh, He's he just reiterating and confirming the things he'd already said 
and, he, and things he'd had done among them. Paul said, I got a testimony. He didn't come, I didn't come with my testimony. Uh, he, actually, Paul said in other places, woe is unto me if I don't preach. Yeah. Just, just, he said the God, he's talking about the gospel testimony, brethren, the one that the record of God's own son. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. And he was talking about the testimony of God, all the people, all God's people, you see. We share this. This is something we have in common. It's another thing we have in common. We, we got this testimony. It's always been the one that God has given. It's, he gives the testimony. We've studied the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and Jacob here recently, the men of faith, and uh, they didn't sojourn in the land uh, with a testimony of their own. Uh, what testimony they did have was supported by what God had said. It, they, they traveled in, in, in the testimony and the word and the promises of God. Now, the testimony that we receive from other men, uh, like my testimony or some other man's testimony, it's like way down on the list. I mean, it's got some credibility because, see, it's founded in the Lord. But it's really way down on the list of preferred testimonials, isn't it? Uh, but because uh, it doesn't have any power, you see, really. It's, uh, the power it does have is because it's, been, it's based in the testimony of God. Uh, but the testimony we have received, brethren, it comes with the power of an endless life of Jesus Christ. Amen. And to those who will receive him, and those who have a desire for him. Now, Jesus came, Jesus is our example in this. He came from heaven. You see, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he came from heaven, having a testimony himself of those things he had seen and heard. That was his testimony. The things that he had seen and heard, the things he had received from the Father, I come, I come with these. He brought them. That was his testimony. And no man receiveth his testimony, John said. And what he had seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony, the scriptures say. Uh, it's a testimony of God. It's God's witness about what he what it's what It's in his record. It was what God had to say. It was John, Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos who said, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things he saw. Record and testimony, and that scripture there is actually the same word, the testimony of God. I'm inclined to think that, well, Paul, when he uses uh, the uh, testimony of God, I'm inclined to think that uh, what Paul had in mind was uh, the entire record of, of what God had to say concerning Jesus Christ. That why, why come then if the power of, of, uh, of God is in the gospel message, which is about Jesus Christ, essentially Jesus Christ, why then would you want to come with another message, you see? If, unless you've got a different agenda than God does. Uh, the testimony of God uh, is what Paul preached. And such as the Apostle John said, and, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The record of God concerning the Son, the testimony of God. It's a message of Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, you see. Paul had this to preach. Paul was given over completely to God, Christ Jesus. His, his ministry was totally centered in this word. And uh, everything else that lied in between this, his ministry, the in-between things, well, uh, Paul depended on the grace of God to kind of take care of. But see, what I'm saying is his focus was on the ministry and the, and the delivering of this word uh, to, to his brethren. There were three things that really pertained that Paul was really... Uh, focus of you can see it in his right. These are the, the three main thrusts of what he had to say. It was his fellowship with the risen Christ. He's, he focuses on that. That was a, that was a uh, fundamental primary thing in his, in his thinking. Amen. And the message that concerned that. See, that was another focus, a focal point. And the grace of God, the grace of God that made, that made him a minister of these things. And we learn a lot from Paul in this, in this area. He preferred the brethren, you see. That's why, that's why, these, that's why he's centered on, on these things because that, that can only benefit the brethren. And uh, he wanted to give them uh, every advantage. He wanted them to have a strong faith. And, uh, and, they, and that kind of thinking of, of, of having a preference for the brethren, it always puts the brethren first, first and foremost. And that was just uh, Paul's... Uh, that was uh, his concern for the status of the saints. How, how's their faith doing? 
when, you know, we studied this, and we've talked about it quite a bit, when Paul wanted to know about how the saints were doing, he was really concerned about how, they was, how their faith was holding up right. because he knew the tactics of the evil one. But Paul sent men out to find out what he wanted to know. He wanted to know how uh, he would, they were, they wanted to know how their faith was so the brethren, would, they would start looking for evidence of faith, evidence of life and growth and increase. How are the brethren doing? How are they standing up? Are they still looking for a city whose builder or maker is God? And uh, for this cause, when I could no longer, when we don't have to conject, guess about this, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. Lest by some means a tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. And our labor be in vain. That, that's everybody's labor. That's Paul and his, the brethren that worked with him. That's all of heaven too, see, brother. That's everybody's labor. The grace that came from God. He didn't want that to be in vain. It's uh, to know the condition of new life in Christ. It was what concerned Paul most about Thessalonians, wasn't it? It was his daily care and concern for all the brethren. The health of their faith. Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you. So why is the tempter uh, after our faith? You see, that's what he's really after, isn't it? Our faith. He, he's wanting to stumble us, cause a hindrance to our faith. Uh, without a faith, he knows you can't stand. Uh, if, I, if, I can, if I can disrupt that flow of faith, I can, uh, I can remove you from God, maybe. That's his thinking. Salvation is a marvelous Marvelous provision. That's very, very broad, very big. Mm -hmm. but that, and, and God has created man with certain needs, with salvation in mind. Man's created man with all kinds of needs. And, and then, he, then he had, but he had salvation that he was going to bring to men. And uh, so all these needs that men have, they're provided for in the salvation of God. All in one source. Uh, the same one who brings and offers salvation, he's the same one who keeps us. We're getting back to why Paul is, is going back to this, this testimony of God. And, and this one, we will be forever linked to him, the one who saved us and the one who kept us. This is our fellowship, you see, the union we have with the Lord, the one who brought us into salvation. He says that fellowship is with him, and we cherish this fellowship. We, we live uh, and we flourish and we're alive through this fellowship. We want to we want to keep it alive. We want to we want this life to flourish, don't we? And we not only that, we want it to get stronger, and we and we want to see it increase. That's the nature of salvation. Uh, we know, of course, we can't do it without a robust faith. We can't manage such a thing on our own. So, hearing the word of the testimony, uh, the word that comes from God, it's what God has said, and it, it'll feed the faith of the brethren there in Corinth. The ones that, you know, that, uh, that will benefit from what he has to say. This is what they need to hear because this word that comes from God, well, then it's life. It'll, it'll get them back. When the saints do not desire God as much. You hear about uh, Or their desire for God has declined and diminished. Maybe this would be the case here. Such as in the case with the Ephesians in the Revelation. Jesus said, I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Or the last uh, Laodiceans, uh, that he says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Yeah. You're neither cold nor hot. Uh -huh. uh, what, what do you do in a situation? What do you do in a situation like this? You, uh, you don't need to call in any specialists or anything like this. Paul didn't do that. Uh -huh. we, we just do like Jesus said. He told them, repent and do the first works. He told the Laodiceans, he said, uh, he said buy from me. Come to me for the things you lack, and you, you get them from me. So we're not directed. Shouldn't be not, we shouldn't be directed to some other source. We come in by the way of the Lord, and we're sustained by him. We never, ever become, we never ever become spiritually self-sustaining yeah. or self-supporting. Mm -hmm. What God has said, it does a work, and we are witnesses of the work of his testimony. It's a marvelous thing, isn't it, brother, to behold how God works uh, and the brethren, we, we actually we become pre preoccupied mm -hmm. with the things of God. Amen. And we become preoccupied with managing the affairs of the new life that God has given us. It becomes the overriding emphasis. Uh, this is what makes us a peculiar people, incidentally. Yeah. For God is foremost, and he's absolutely central in our considerations. And, and we, 
I mean, to the world, spending so much time going after the unseen or spending so much time in the unseen uh, realm, that, that makes us peculiar, strange lot to the world, that, we, we would, that our main focus would be on God uh, in this matter. And, but, you know, it takes us further and further away from this world, yeah. this preoccupation with Christ and, and the pursuit of the new life in Him. It takes us further and further away from the flesh. It, it certainly is peculiar to the world. Uh, it's always got our attention, and, uh, and so we go after it. We never really get away uh, from the flesh in this world, so we have to kind of like just stay on, yeah. stay on this path. We have to kind of just keep at it all the time. We just can't let up. Uh, we, the flesh, while we, we just have it with us all the time, we go to bed with it, we get up with it. The world, the same thing, is always there. It's always after our attention. Uh, the world and the flesh, that is, it's always after our attention. Uh, and we, we never can get away from it. All that we can do, brethren, is just sort of kind of like get on a different frequency. Okay, just get on a different channel. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, that channel, that heavenly channel, and that heavenly frequency. And when we do, you know, the flesh and the world, it becomes like a, a background chatter or some kind of static. You, I mean, you hear it in the background, but you really didn't hear what they said. I mean, I was listening I didn't hear what he said. I was listening to a clear word from God. I was listening, I was listening to a clear word, a testimony of the Lord. The gospel message. It's those things that concern, directly concern Jesus Christ. And this is where God has placed all his wisdom in. We, uh, we have a lot of people who don't believe. We talked about this this morning, incidentally. Uh, Sister June's opening was actually a good opening. For, for what I wanted to say this morning, because, see, the wisdom of God, it actually comes from this, this truth, that God is truth, and, and this wisdom comes from him. And it's, it supersedes this wisdom that comes from man. So we, if, we, if we default in any time to kind of like to the wisdom of men, you know, and, and uh, if that's a bad thing. When we got the wisdom of God, he is the truth. Men don't, obviously don't believe that uh, God has placed his wisdom in Jesus Christ in this way. I, I mean, what other conclusion can you come up with? They wouldn't be talking about other stuff so much Amen. if they really believed it, that uh, Jesus Christ, if, if the wisdom of God was important to men and they believed it, that it was hid in Christ Jesus, they wouldn't talk about so many other different things. It makes you wonder, I'm really serious, it makes you wonder if, these, if they really know the Lord at all sometimes. Uh, but to begin with, do they know Jesus Christ? Because, you know, knowing the Lord changes everything. Just one of our meetings we talked about, the, knowing the Lord changes everything. Why, if, uh, if they'd, in verse 8 in the same chapter, if they'd have known who the Lord was, if he was the Prince of Glory, it would have changed everything. He, Paul said they wouldn't have crucified him because it, knowing him changes everything. So, let, we, so we come before the brethren. Let us come before the brethren with God's testimony because it'll, it'll change things. Just as Paul comes before the brethren in Corinth, and it please God that all, all uh, Christ and Christ should dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, if Paul could preach with confidence, and confidence, he could have confidence and, and the testimony of God because of the record of God that uh, all these things were in him. Now, the real tragedy, brethren, of being exposed, and you'll see this, it accounts for all the, the convoluted way of thinking in Corinth. It accounts for all the confusion and all the problems that have been exposed to the wisdom of men. And, and the real tragedy of being exposed to this is the damage it does. It, I mean, it's like getting rid of it. Once you've, once you've ingested it, it's getting it out of your system. I mean, <clears throat> after you've been delivered, look how long it takes to get over this wisdom of men. It, uh, it, it really gets entrenched in the flesh. Now, to the institutional way of doing things, it's, it, which is always mechanical and uh, legalistic, Paul lays it out plain for us here in this chapter. I mean, it's plain for us to see why the special gifts and talents that go a long way in the denominational world and, and, and within the wisdom of men, they're, they're worthless in the kingdom of God. They are. They don't, they, that's why Paul didn't come with it. They're worthless. They won't do any good if you're promoting Christ Jesus. Now, the many things that are important in the religious world, they're just not really important to God at all. 
are they? They just aren't. I, I think about uh, the fall of, we brought up at almost every meeting, we'll bring it up, the fall of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. You know, you, the very moment it happens, the very moment it happened, whenever men <laughs> applied their reason, their own reasoning uh -huh. to, the, to, to the wisdom, to the things of God, uh, I think right then, mm -hmm. that's when heaven ceased to be involved. Yeah. They, they, they just, just had to get back back off from it and get out, get out of the way. It's just what, it's what the wisdom of men will do to, such, to the things that God is doing. The wisdom of men is the way men think about things. It's what we're talking about. It's the way they approach things and the way they think. That's the wisdom of men. And we're talking about men who are on the outside of God, the wisdom of men. God doesn't think like them. Thank God they, that he doesn't. You see, that's why Paul... He, he, he speaks the way he does. It's the reason Paul didn't waste his time going into this area. On the, he didn't, Paul didn't bring up anything unless it was directly related to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I've made up my mind. I, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to quit spending so much time on things that's not really uh, central to, to the message of Jesus Christ. And, and, and I have a tendency to get on things that's really not centered. I'm, I probably spent too much time talking about the institution that I came out of and Babylon and things like that. And, then I, and when I was writing this, I made a commitment that when the Lord comes or when Babylon falls, I'm not going to talk about Babylon anymore. I'm going to let it go. I spent too much time there. Seriously, though, uh, focusing on the testimony of God and talking about and speaking about Jesus Christ is where all the work is going to be done. And because if we can get people to Jesus, see, then, there, then that solves all the other problems, doesn't it? That's why Paul, he, he has to address some of these things, you know, but he's really focusing on getting them back to where, when I, when I came to you, <laughs> all the way back to that, declaring unto you the testimony of God. This, this is the reason Paul wanted the brethren, the reason Paul wanted them to stand, he wanted their faith to stand. He didn't want to, he didn't want to see Corinth, the brethren he had been with, he didn't want them to. He didn't want to see them fail and fall. He didn't want them to be uncertain and unstable. Uh -huh. He was establishing the brethren, which we, that's talked about a lot in the scripture. We talk a lot about the brethren being established. He did, he didn't want them to be uncertain, and uh, he wanted them to be to be uh, confident and assured. He wanted their faith proven, you see, and the evidence of faith, so that you may stand. Now, Paul was talking about a particular kind of standing, the only one you can do by faith. Mm -hmm. He was talking about when the standing uh, against the wiles of the devil. That's the kind of standing he was talking about. Now, unstable, uh, it's a condition that Paul didn't want the brethren to be in, of course. It's, a, it's the worst kind of thing to be in. Uh, even in this world, you know, uh, even, even in the physical realm, uh, unstable and uncertain situations is the most undesirable thing to the world, even even to us, uh, to them. Uh, uh, there there can't be, but in the kingdom of God, though, there can't be no more grievous thing uh, than a, uh, an unstable and an, uh, a uh, a uh, a uh, I forgot my word I want to use, but I'll just move on. An unstable, an unfaithful heart. You see, it's, it's, it's grievous because God can't use it. It's absolutely of no use to God because it's like, the, it's like a ship on a sea. It's, uh, it's all over the place, and, and God is not interested in that. That's the kind of heart that men, uh, after the fall of Adam and Eve, after the fall, this is the kind of heart that men had, and the unregenerate heart, the one that was hopelessly lost because it was like unstable and uncertain. It, it had no direction, you see. Uh, it wavered up and down, and it was back and forth, and it was just unreliable. Uh, this was, it was, that's what happened to men. It, it, their heart wasn't secure anymore because a man's heart before the fall, why, it, 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 it belonged to God. A man's heart belonged to God then. It, it always directed Adam and Eve to God. His heart did. It, uh, Adam's heart, it pleased God before the fall, and at ease did too. Uh, I'm thinking the heart of, of uh, the man's heart before the fall, it was like a, a magnetic compass. I thought of this. I, would, I wanted to use it. it uh, you know, a magnetic compass always points north. Uh, you can carry it around in your pocket uh, and all over the place, and, and you can pull it out, 
and, and in a moment, it'll give it a second or so, and it'll point, always point north. Uh, if you've got a reliable compass, one to work, I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to stay lost because it, it'll give you a sense of direction. Man was created with this kind of capacity, you see, and he was capable of doing this. When it came to things of God, Adam knew which way was up. He knew. He, he knew God. He knew what God expected. He had a sense of what God wanted and what, uh, what God wanted out of him. But the fall, it like destroyed man's orientation to God, didn't it? it, uh, it he lost his sense of where north was or he lost his sense of where up was. He was not able to locate and find God anymore. But you now... Praise God, you see. But now God solved the situation. He gave us Jesus Christ. And so in him, we always have our direction back back to God. He has given, he's given men actually a new heart, one that works and one that's stable and reliable. And this new heart, it all the time knows where, where God is at. It knows which way to go and, and, and which way heaven is. It always points to heaven. Paul wants to train the brethren into this how to use their new heart, and he does this by bringing them to Christ. And, and so that uh, how are the brethren established and trained in the things of God? Well, it's, uh, we direct them back to the Word of God. And uh, we do this by primarily, of course, what he said about Jesus Christ. Paul, you know, I, Paul really wants to get the brethren as far as he, way as he can, as far as way as he can from men. Uh, he wants the saints to be closely knit together, but he wants the saints far away from the wisdom of this world so he can get them. It's them, those who are on the outside of the fellowship of God. He wants them away from them. Those, those who uh, are, on, are outside of God, they can only speak about the things of this world. Paul don't want them around them. This wisdom they have belongs to this world, and uh, he doesn't want them to hear this. The Lord doesn't want his people palling around with those who are lost to God, you see. He wants to get you far away as he can from this world and those who belong to it. And you got to keep your distance from the unclean thing, right? If you want to stay clean yourself, right. well, it makes all the sense in the world. What possible benefit can those who are walking by sight, you know, always looking for something, what can they do for people who are looking at the unseen things of God? Uh, there's a way, you know, that seemeth right to a man, the scriptures say, but the ways thereof are death. It says it several times since it, Jeremiah said, oh, I love the scripture, O oh, Lord, O oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. You know, men really can't see what the wisdom of this world is doing in the, out, out there. And I'm talking about in the religious world. They, they really can't see the direction it's taking them. If they could, they really could see it clearly, then they, they wouldn't go. But, see, they, they can't see uh, what, what's It's a complicated thing, actually. And, uh, and I, I'm not even going to go there because I, I don't even want to pretend to understand all of it. What God is doing with the, with the foolishness of a man's wisdom, but he's doing something, okay? He's showing man something but by this. So, but, uh, but we know, but we know enough to know that the, that the wisdom of men has been, has been absolutely rejected by God. He won't have it. And, that's, and it certainly needs to be because it's not worth having. Now, God has rejected it. God is not going to get behind any kind of plan or any kind of idea that men come up with in regards to salvation. And now we know we're all sitting right here. We know this. We know how important it is that God direct our way and that God leads our steps. And we know that the wisdom we get, that it must come from the knowledge of our understanding of the Lord. We know these things. And, and this wisdom that we get from God is generated by a faith that he has given us. And when we grow in that and, and, and we, we feed on this trust in the promises of God. And we got to know that we throw faith out the window, brethren, when we talk, take a hold of the wisdom of men or we just get contaminated by it. In verse 3 and 4, Paul said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. In the account given in Acts 8.10, you remember Paul talks about when he first came into Corinth and he declared the things of God in Christ Jesus. He was met with considerable opposition. You remember that. 
uh, because of their continual blasphemy and contradiction of the truth of Paul, kind of making fun of him, I think, contradicting what he said, looking for things. That's where, this is in Corinth where Paul, he threw down and withdrew and he went to the Gentiles. It was in a night vision that God came to Paul, give him some comfort and strength. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall uh, set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. God said, speak. And Paul references speaking in verse 3. This is what Paul is doing in verse 3. And I was with, uh, in my speech, this is what, what God said to do. And, uh, and he says, my speech, my speaking, and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Now, this speech and this speaking was the preaching of Jesus Christ. And this, of course, is what, this is what God wanted Paul to speak about. He's, he's wanting him to preach the testimony, his testimony. Men have their ways of thinking, their reasonings, and, and uh, their suppositions, and their philosophies. And God has his testimony. He has, he has his Christ. He has his crucified Christ. That's what God has. On the one hand, you have these other things, and on the other hand, you have a Christ who's been crucified. There's only one reason why Paul would be preaching a crucified Christ. Anyway, for the crucified Christ is the good part of, of, of the sin and transgression. This is a good part that all men are in trespasses and sin. This means that if Paul has been pre is preaching a crucified Christ, that means that he's already made it clear about the condition of men. If he can preach that, uh, when all men that all men have been separated from life of God, that all men are born sinners, and that are they are by no means uh, any good uh, to themselves or anybody else. After you have preached that it's after you have uh, preached that it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Then you can preach a crucified Christ. You see, that, that comes after all of these things. When God told Paul to speak, don't hold back, he certainly didn't have to tell Paul what to speak. He said, you, you speak it, you preach it. Paul knew what to say. And so he didn't you come in there with all the different kind of things. And he, there's only one problem that Paul needed to address. He didn't need to address particular problems that were the outbreak of that one big problem. Uh -huh. he, he wanted to address the one big problem. And that, that was uh, men want to do the wrong things, you see. That's the problem he was addressing. So, but he wanted to get him back to Christ because coming back to Jesus, when he'll change that, and then we can go from there. Do not be afraid. Speak and hold not thy peace. Speak out and don't be silent, Paul. That's what I have many people in this city. When, was Paul weak and fearful and trembling person? Well, not by any means. But he, you see, Paul has emptied himself before these brethren. That's when he initially came to them. He has made himself transparent, in other words, in order that the power of God and the Spirit of God could be glorified in, his, in him. Paul did not come to them with, and he could. Paul could have come to them with an outstanding Jewish heritage. We were talking about this earlier. He could have have. He could have been introduced. This morning we have the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul, come to speak to us this morning. And I want to tell you a little bit about this this brother. And you know how they do. And he gives all this thing that he's this and he's that and oh and and. But see, Paul, see that'll be a distraction. To what I gotta say. That's something that the flesh will get in or in. I don't want the flesh. The flesh ain't got anything to do with what I'm gonna tell you this morning, brother. So I'm gonna come before you and I'm gonna make myself as invisible as I can. And I'm gonna let I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna preach the testimony of God. Yeah. And so he didn't come to them and any with anything that the boat the flesh could boast in, something that might distract from a crucified Christ. Paul didn't come to them and the confidence is on, on his own ability, and he had them. <coughs> Uh, but he didn't want to demonstrate. I'm going to say this too. He didn't want, and this is important. He didn't want to demonstrate. He didn't want to uh, kind of demonstrate the power of his public speaking. You see, that's, that's something that you know that the flesh, you know, like would enter in, quick to enter in. Uh, Paul, he uh, he didn't have any confidence in that in himself. On purpose, he came to them. He came to them weak, fearful, and trembling. You see, and that's what he wanted to be stripped of the things that would make the flesh confident. We stand, really we stand weak and fearful and trembling because we can put ourselves to rely on God. 
you see, to, 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 to speak through it. Paul has not forgotten the night vision where it's God said, I'll be with you. And he wanted God to be with him. So he didn't come in with anything else. To the, uh, so anyway, Paul was not weak, fearful, and trembling in the spirit. But the, and so the demonstration, so he could say the demonstration of the spirit and the power of God was there, that the gospel message and my preaching of the gospel might be demonstrated in this way. It rests solely. It's what he had to say, what he had to say, the way he presented, the way he said it, it rests solely on the demonstration of the spirit and the power of God. I'm going to think, I'm going to think that since we have it said this way, that if you're going to, if someone gets up and, and, is, and it doesn't present, the gospel message in this in the way that Paul has outlined it for us here. I don't really expect that you can see any kind of demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. Then, yeah. 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 otherwise, Paul wouldn't be so wouldn't have been so adamant. You know that uh, be, Paul does not, Paul does not give any other kind of evidence or point to any other kind of demonstration to authenticate his ministry and his message. He's going to let the Spirit and the power of God do it. You see. Remember when I was out there with you? He didn't. He, I, he didn't. He didn't take them back to it, back to there. Remember when I was with, with you back then? We started with just twenty-five of you, and when I left, we were the largest group in town. He didn't use that to authenticate what he had to say. Well, we had our humble beginnings in Justice Home, but when I left, we had a place ten times bigger. In the local synagogue. See, he didn't take them back to these kind of things, you see. He took them back to the Spirit. Remember the Spirit and the power of God working in you? See, I, I just don't think Paul ever allowed the flesh to promenade at all when he spoke in the name of the Lord. But rather, his confirmation that his message was the testimony of God, that he allowed the Spirit to demonstrate it in the power of God. Paul has already separated himself from the speakers of his day who are only interested in the art of persuasion and convincing people. And that's dawned on me because of who he was talking to. That's all these people thought about. Paul was very clear and emphatic that he didn't have a personal agenda at all. It was, it was already clear he didn't, present some, he didn't represent some religious outfit or anything like that. He didn't, really, he didn't uh, represent any philosophical point of view. But, and everybody else that the Greeks had encountered in town those who'd come in and after them, they were, not in, they were not interested in instructing people like Paul was. They were just wanting to persuade them and convince them to join up with my way of thinking. See, that's all they've been introduced to. But Paul comes in instructing men concerning righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And this dawned on me when Brother Gibbon brought out the other day when Felix preaching of Felix. These are the things that Paul, Paul was interested in instructing men in the ways of the Lord, not just persuading, convincing men that, hey, we got the right thing here. The demonstration of the power in man's wisdom to persuade and convince others. Well, Paul wasn't interested in that. Or on the other hand, we have men who came in and for all their excellent words and enticing words and for all their persuasive and convincing ability, what did they have to show for it? Well, all the Corinthians had to do was look up, look back, Paul wants them to look back when he was there, and then look what kind of mess you got right now. Yeah. And then they and you and you judge for yourself. Yeah. Okay. That's what he was wanting him and, and he wanted him to see now the wisdom that comes from man worth two cents, you see, because look at the mess you got. And so uh, what do their results show? Well, he's got to address all kinds of contentions and divisions, strife and confusion, and just sin in chapter 5. But Paul comes declaring and preaching. He's not wanting to know anything else among them but the testimony of God and him crucified. And it's demonstrated with the spirit and the power of God. Men can talk in their own wisdom till they're blue in the face. And they're not one thing of God will be illuminated or become clear to them. Yeah. It won't happen if, in this way. And, uh, and, but, and so, but one thing uh, we can count on is that when, when the things of God are spoken and when the, like the testimony of God is preached, and we know that spiritual things, things will start to clear up <laughs> and things will start to opening up. And we'll, begin, we'll be start understanding and seeing more. And isn't this a real demonstration that, that the God is at work and that we belong to him? 
when, when, it's, when after we've come to Jesus and the things of God start making sense to us, isn't that the real demonstration? That's what Paul, yeah. that the affection, does, we lose the affections for this world, isn't that the demonstration? And that, uh, and that but the, the affections of the world to come, they start growing more intense and stronger. That's the demonstration. Uh, that we're being, we can see the evidence in our brethren that they're being changed from one stage of glory to the next. That's what we're looking for. Uh, uh, <clears throat> We, the, the things that uh, really do the talking, that's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, do men really think, and I, I have to say this, I spent a minute here, but do men really think that, do they really believe that the outpouring of the miraculous gifts is what is meant here? I mean, that's what I was taught. I know about you. I mean, is that what really Paul was talking about? Is this the kind of thing that's greater and more sought after than the demonstration of reconciliation and, de and, and redemption in men? I mean, is that greater than insight and spiritual gifts being poured out here? Is that really greater than insight into the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ and having discernment between good and right, uh, good and wrong? I mean, could that be more important than recognizing the things of God? Well, I'm telling you, sometimes we, we, just, we just want men to just get away from this kind of thinking. See, that's the wisdom of men. There's an example of it. Yes. Now, all the Corinthians had to do like I said, was compare, take notes, and compare what, what way it was when Paul was there and what it's like now. And, uh, and yeah. so with the mess and the, the situation they've got. Now, it's, no, so, it's not so much by Paul's design that God would demonstrate himself in this way. Why, it was the arrangement of the gospel by God that, that set these things in motion. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God, Amen. see. God orchestrated that, it, and God is, and Paul's just preaching it. It is God who decided that the preaching of a crucified Savior would be as foolishness and weakness in the eyes of men. God does it that, that your faith should stand uh, in the wisdom of God. It's, and, and, and that your faith should stand, see, that your faith should stand. Well, that's a demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God, see. Paul is trying to get them back to them. You got to ask yourself. You see, you have to ask yourself. I mean, we do this all the time. This is like an automatic checkup throughout the day, all the time, all the time, all the time. Is my life characterized by that demonstration of the spirit and power of God? Yeah, we don't. We don't have to. I don't have to ask you to do that, or, or. You know, we, we do that automatically. The saints are constantly assessing themselves, and this in the view of it's a, it's God being. Uh, it's demonstrated in my life. We call it these kind of evidences all the time, you know. When people who really care about these kind of things, they want to grow. People who bring, say these things to them, they want to grow. And uh, they want to make progress. That's why they ask them, yeah. am I making them progress? You know, they want to. Well, uh, I can say this about that kind of thing. If you're really concerned about that kind of thing, if you're, if you're bringing up these assessments throughout the day, then, you know, I, I have all the confidence God's going to continue to work mm -hmm. that he set out to do. He will bring you to his eternal abode. He, yeah. he will not stop. And so, you know, uh, I leave you with this, brother. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we reject the things of man, mm -hmm. and we, we take hold of the things of God, and then we, we go from there. Thank you, brother. Amen.